I'm here with uh, Tal Keret, um, president of Silverstone Properties, a good friend of ours. Um, uh, I'm sitting right now, as you can see here, in my dungeon in Rye, New York, not in my beautiful offices that are at the World Trade Center. Um, and um, as you can, um, and I'm very happy that Tal is here with us. Uh, uh, leading Silverstone Properties that is behind the World Trade Center, the Four Seasons, a, a major, one of the most prominent firms in the real estate uh, in, in the United States and in the world. And uh, as I've mentioned in my post before, he also comes from the technology world. Uh, so I uh, can also uh, give us a little bit of uh, his views on tech and what's going on there and how they're coping with what's going on and what, what are his advices to uh, everybody. So Tal, welcome. Thank you. Hi. Good morning, Danny. Thank you. How are you doing? So thank you very much for being with us here today. Um, so um, I wanted maybe to start, you know, with sharing your thoughts about what's going on. You know, how you guys see it. Uh, what do you expect is going to happen? How does it affect your business, your life, everything? Okay, thanks. Uh, good morning. Look at uh, where we all sit now, where you are uh, sitting in a different place, where technology is driving everything we do because we're all confined to our homes. And uh, I appreciate you inviting and the audience that is with us, the attendees, uh, even though I cannot see you all. So hi, I hope you're all doing well. It's funny when we start the conversations, I used to always ask people, so where am I catching you? How are you doing? Uh, I know most of the time where I'm catching them. They're still at the same place at home for the last 36 days. Um, but we are doing well. I can't uh, find things to complain about other than the world change. It's uh, what we call a sudden stop, where globally there are issues in almost every country across the United States. Uh, it's something that nobody prepared for well enough. There's some people, of course, uh, extreme cases, but as a whole, we see that uh, people did not prepare for a situation like this, did not anticipate a situation like this. Uh, yet another uh, black swan um, situation. But uh, I think people are adjusting, some better than others, some are in better shape. And of course, uh, the sad thing is that it impacts a lot of people and a lot of lives, some of them in a way that uh, we see the casualties and the people who pass away every day on the news. And uh, a lot of people also in, in every other aspect of their life, staying at home, working from home, some lost their jobs or uh, temporarily lost their jobs. It, it will have an impact on many, many lives uh, in the United States, in Europe, in the rest of the world. And many people that, uh, are sitting there and saying, so what next? What do we do next? How do we um, come out of this better and stronger? I think uh, what we see is uh, that many people after the initial shock are becoming more optimistic and are very resilient. They find ways to live their lives, to grow their business. And we don't expect this to be something that uh, stays with us forever. Of course, when we will look at it a few years into the future, it would look very different than what it looks today uh, when we look at ourselves and saying what it means to be at home with the family or without family. Um, when people are sitting at home by themselves, locked every day in the same uh, smaller place than they are used to, uh, it's not easy. Some countries, people are in a full lockdown. Um, I can say when I'm speaking to my uh, father or my my brother and his family that they're in Israel over there, there are certain days that they're not allowed to go out, period, completely. Uh, in the United States, it's a little more free where you can go out, but not too far. You can go to uh, specific uh, supermarkets or places to get food, essentials. Uh, but there are recommendations, but not uh, legal enforcement that if you went too far on a bicycle ride, uh, something uh, bad will happen where in other countries it's much more severe, much more serious, and the impact uh, on the psychology, on the emotions, and on the physical uh, of people is, is much more serious. But bottom line, we, in a few months, we will find our way slowly and gradually uh, out of this situation. 
and uh, find the new, the new normal for people to our expectation. Now, I, I start by, by saying something from my side. I saw uh, your first uh, speaker who was, uh, I think, terrific. Uh, Scaramucci was great and he has uh, opinions and everybody has their own opinion. If you ask me, I have my opinion, but it's only an opinion. And every person is entitled and will have their own opinion. Uh, my opinions are not unique. They are not uh, special. They come from uh, things that we see, things that we witness, and from the many, many conversations uh, that we have with our tenants. And I spend my days, every day since this started, uh, from 9 a.m. with a phone call that has the leadership group, we call it, uh, including weekends, 9 a.m. with Larry Silverstein, a guy that is uh, young at heart, uh, a little older in, in uh, physical. He's turning 89 now and with tons of energy, he wakes up in the morning. So what are we doing? How are people doing? Uh, and how can we help other people? And having that 9 a.m. conversation and then go on to the rest of the day and then interview and speak and help every one of the different uh, partners, tenants, and people that we work with, they, they give a lot of information. So everything you will ask me today, and I will we'll open the floor for people to ask questions, everything you will want to know, I'm happy to answer uh, to the extent I can, uh, is not my knowledge or any smarts that come from us, but rather an aggregate of a lot of uh, smarter people than us. We have uh, um, about 240 of the top largest companies in the world, CEOs, of course, we have many more smaller tenants, but of the largest uh, companies in the world, uh, and to get their opinion, of course, there are many opinions, and each of them comes from their vantage point, gives us some pretty good picture of uh, where they expect things to go. I hope this was a, a long answer to a short question, but I hope it was helpful. Mm -hmm, definitely. Now, I will ask you, I will go through uh, the different sections, but maybe first, when I'm looking at the employment world, you, you, you are a major employer and you come from the technology space uh, and you know how it is, especially in technology, they always say, you know, when, when the employee comes and say, hey, um, you know what, these guys across the street are paying me 30% more, they'll pay me 25, maybe I'll stay. I don't think the empl uh, employees will come now and tell you, um, uh, the guys across the street are paying now 40% low, uh, maybe take my salary down 30%. Um, you know, obviously, my question is basically about um, are we going to see a new world now in the employment world? How, how do you see that happening? Uh, it's important for everybody who's listening to us, which are basically employers and employees. So. Um, great question. It's a great question. Um, it depends on many parameters. But, uh, and it depends on the company, it depends on the field, it depends on the industry, and it depends on competition. Eventually the world converges uh, and the markets are smarter than not most people. So the world converges to a place where there is a market rate for employment. There is a market rate for employees. Companies that are doing extremely well today, and there are very few, there are not too many of those, they'll have to hire and they have to fight for every employee and they will pay what they have to pay to get those employees. I had a conversation um, with over 30 CEOs um, a couple of weeks ago, and I speak every day with CEOs one-on-one, -on -one, but I had a 30 people CEOs on one call asking, so tell us what to do because uh, they expect us to give them some guidance or seeing some of it. And for the majority of them, almost all of them, uh, the answer was pretty uh, similar. And I can tell you across uh, the CEOs we have, we interviewed about 18% said, uh, that they're not going to either cut employees uh, and re reduce their headcount dramatically or uh, reduce salaries. And many of them are doing both because this is where the market is. If, if uh, a lot of pe people are let go and they had to hire and they overpaid or they think they overpaid for some employees, this is the time they have to right size the business for profitability. The assumption is that cash is king. The companies need to survive. Employees look at their company and say, well, people survive, companies don't, which means that an employee that was fur uh, furloughed or uh, let go will have hardship for a couple of months, but if they're good and smart and have uh, the understanding and some knowledge behind them, they will find a job, not to try and be harsh here, 
but the, the companies cannot survive if they are keeping a very high expense and a very and, and revenues go down. And if the companies don't survive, then all the employees will suffer. So I, I've seen companies, and I'll give an example without the name of the company. The CEO went over. We had a long conversation. Uh, he didn't fully know what to do, even though his company is running revenues over two hundred million dollars revenue. But it's the first time he faces such a situation. He's in his early forties. And he said, what would you do? And I went through this myself. I said, I'll tell you what I did. Uh, I don't know what you should do, but because you know your business better. And, and take a big piece of paper. In this case, he has to do it on a computer. Uh, we did it on a whiteboard at the time because now everybody is locked at home. Write the names of all the employees. And now you're rehiring them. You're rehiring your employees. Who is great? Who is a great team player? Who is phenomenal in working with other people? Who is uh, with a great motivation and who is a downer and pull, pulls people down, but you have them because you needed their position, but they're not necessarily the optimal. And then those who are not excellent, replace them. There will be a lot of people out there that are terrific for, the, for a good price. You will have to replace those people. You're rehiring because you're rebuilding your company now in a situation that uh, is a must for the company to survive. Uh, and then you will go to the management and you'll say, when times were great and you came and asked for a higher salary and you we got uh, an increase, we increased. But if the economy is pulling us down, we have to reduce our salaries. And when things will come back and everything will be great, uh, we will probably increase back according to every person's performance and market rate. People don't come to you, as you said, and say, oh, by the way, I see that my market rate is lower now uh, because there are uh, two times the number of people in my position than, than I am. So please, can you reduce my salary? They won't do that. It's not in their best interest. But it is a necessity for a leadership, for a CEO to go back and do that. And the first thing they have to do it, to my opinion, which I told them, is to yourself, to your own salary. And you're starting to see it with CEOs of large corporations saying, I'm forgiving 50% of my salary, sometimes 80% of my salary, in order for other people uh, to understand that we're all together in this uh, situation and we'll come out of this and then things will balance themselves out. Um, my recommendation is also to, when you rehire the people, is to rehire them uh, by culture first, by talent second. Not to focus on, oh, I have this superstar, but they aggravate other people because at times like these people have to come together. People have to feel very good about the people they work with. They're going to work um, 20, 30% harder than they could before, uh, and everybody's looking at everyone. And if you keep the people that are not additive to the team, you, you lose a lot. You have to focus on getting the right people. Now, putting that aside, there are some companies that are running so fast, they're doing so well because of they hit it right, the market worked in their advantage, that they just have to focus on hiring at the moment. But those are, as I said before, very few. It's, uh, in our in our portfolio and where we see it's, it's something in the 18% of the CEOs according to those I spoke with. And again, I didn't speak with all of them, but I spoke to the majority and that's what I'm seeing uh, their behavior. This is a good sample size that says people will have to readjust. If you take it to an extreme, someone that deals with retail a lot and selling on the street, they will suffer much, much more than someone that all their focus was online business. Uh, one of the companies announced it publicly, so you can see it in the papers. They are looking now to hire a lot of folks, better, uh, better mortgage, or if you go to the website better.com, they are talking about hiring now another thousand people very quickly in New York while they are still sitting at home. But they need to hire the people because there are so many people looking to refinance their mortgages, uh, and better is capturing a lot of them. They're very good online, the rates are good still, uh, and the consumers are asking for that. So the opportunity for some companies is there. No. As I told you before, uh, I expected so many questions we, we got that uh, uh, we have here, and I know you have limited time, so maybe we'll do another session, hopefully, uh, because you cover so much, you know, both technology and real estate. But I'll start um, um, asking you, uh, um, real estate, what do you see happening in real estate? What do you think will happen next? Uh, how will the real estate change with what's going on right now? Uh, what happens with the hotels, you know, the, the, that industry that got hit so hard from each and every way. What do you think is going to happen with aviation? Um, do you see chapter 11's coming? Uh, yes, no, yes, yes. No, <laughs> you're asking four questions at, at, uh, at once. Uh, 
and it's hard to answer it uh, in, in a quick swoop, but real estate. Real estate is a big industry. It's larger than on all the equities. Um, if we looked at the numbers that were expected before this all started and, and where the balance is, we, none of us know 100%, but the real estate in the US, uh, when we looked at it, was about 250 trillion. Equities were 76 trillion. But the numbers keep on moving. Real estate is fairly significant, but it has so many layers. So which real estate and which location, we have to really break it down and dive, kind of double click on it and open the folders and see many more elements. You have real estate that is hit hard if you're looking at the retail, if you're looking at student housing where students are not going to schools, the schools are shut down. So certain real estates there will be hit hard. If you're looking at storage places or if you're looking at office places, as long as you have good tenants in the office, you'll be fine. You, you will not be hurt because you're going by the credit of your tenants. Um, multifamily and homes, rental homes, um, in some areas will be impacted more, in some areas will be impacted less, or in some areas almost no impact at all. At all. And there are certain balances between those that eventually will converge to a certain place. So if someone was overly exposed to retail, I think it's a big hit for now. In two years, uh, some of the retail, a lot of the retail will come back in one variation or another. Uh, Scaramucci said it yesterday, he believes in, re in uh, real estate. I believe in real estate. Uh, I'm looking at it from different perspectives, there are opportunities there. But as a whole, people need space. As, as you are experiencing, are you enjoying every minute that you are uh, working from home at the moment? Or I'm not enjoying any minute that I'm working from home right now. I have, I'm locked here in the basement, so the kids, five of them, won't be coming barging in. So, no, I mean, uh, you know, we're surviving here, but uh, there are good things to it, but obviously, you know, we need the office. Yeah, so we see a lot of people telling us we will need to go back to the office, but it will be different. We will let some of our employees work from home a day or two a week because we see that it's doable, but it's not enjoyable, and for some of them, it's impossible. Because when you're at home, the kids expect it all of a sudden to look like and behave like a weekend. And they jump and they make noises and they, they can't work, uh, including their interactions with their spouses, which we see that for some people is very challenging. Like one of our tenants that came to us and said at some point, um, oh, we, we want uh, some relief. We said, what are you? we know what they're doing. They're a law firm. And we said, why? You, you're still working. There is no hardship here. And eventually they said, okay, we're paying, no problem. Uh, and we figured out actually that their business is booming when uh, the business of uh, divorces over there is going through the roof because a lot of people now figure out that uh, they're not really enjoying spending 30 days together locked in the same uh, apartment. The solutions for that could be different. They could have uh, bigger apartments with a terrace and, and stuff like that. But uh, some businesses are, are enjoying. So back to the real estate question, and then I'll go to the second and third question you asked about hotels. Um, the real estate as a whole, people have to readjust their thinking and say, where is the real estate located? Is it a great location? And what is the mix of tenants? Many people focused on getting the highest rent uh, and filling a building, doesn't matter. Whoever is paying the highest rent will take that. Um, our focus was always to look at, uh, and, and again, this is not a trying to sell it or propaganda. The, the, this is just a dialogue. The focus was always on diversification and the credit level of the tenant. Never to have only one industry in a property because you don't know what will happen to that property at hard times. Um, and never focus, or never take tenants just because they're paying more. We had a lot of those. Uh, take the ones with the strongest credit. You're willing to take a much lower rent as long as their credit is very, very solid. And when that happens, you get much better results uh, long term when issues like this happen. The question that most time I would ask is, are you a short term or long term holder of the real estate? If you're looking at it as a trade, though, those who are talking about flipping, eventually you'll be caught um, like some smarter people than me uh, were said, uh, when things like this happen, when econ economies go down, Warren Buffett said, you'll see who is swimming without the bathing suit. Um, in, in our case, you will see who has the strong credit and who just said, oh, I can get the highest rent. I, I'll fill 50% of the building with the WeWork and something else. And then they are hit very badly. Uh, and those who have credit who weather the storm and come out of this, uh, maybe with some scars, but not with uh, fatal injury. And uh, that's, that's what we are seeing now happening around. Opportunities, of course, will come where someone cannot pay their debt. 
and you can step in and help uh, recover a good asset in a good location and make that asset do better. And to the end of the spectrum would be storage places. Storage places, people will still pay for their storage. They, they're not going to take it out, especially not when you can see it yourself when you're sitting in your apartment with five kids running around. There is very low chance that you're going to run and say, okay, let me get all my stuff for my storage because I can't pay the $29 a month that I need to pay. So storage is in the other extreme of great low income uh, per square foot. It's known to be the lowest income per square foot, but it's very, very, very solid pays you. People also ask about other variations of real estate like parking, what is happening with parking. So parking in a, in a place where most of the payers are members and subscribers that pay a monthly because they have to put their car like in Manhattan, those are not suffering. Parking that is in an open place next to a mall is suffering. So the question in general real estate is, is like saying, how are people feeling in the world? It depends where, it depends who, it depends their age group, it depends on, on 50 different parameters. I need to dive deep in and, and tell you then per location, per asset class, what is the general feeling in that area? Um, so that's that. The second question, sorry, you, you wanted to comment on this? No, no, I'm, I'm waiting to hear. Um... On the hospitality. You asked about hotels. So hotels in general are suffering until people will feel comfortable to travel, until people will feel comfortable to go on vacations, uh, the hotels will start to open. And you will start to see hotels opening, uh, depends on the location and what is the purpose of the hotel. For example, um, there are hotels like a, uh, a hotel in, we, we have a hotel in, in the Disney park. The, we, we built the largest Four Seasons, uh, which is there, the largest development, which has a lot of acreage, and, but it's in the Disney park. So as long as the Disney park is locked down, uh, that hotel will have to be shut down because there, there's not gonna be traffic and to maintain everything and the staff and, and paying for all the operational costs when you have no people coming in, that's not a wise decision. Plus you don't want to infect people, you want to be smart about all of the, of the operations. Hotels will come back, and some of them will come back faster than others. Um, when business travel will also open up, and I think it will open up uh, in the next few months, then you'll start seeing people going between cities. It may not be open to every country in the world, so there will be some financial impact, and hotels will start to rehire their employees in a certain pace until they get full, uh, to the full capacity. Um, the question then is on different grades of hotels, is it between the lower end hotels or the highest end hotels? It really depends on the travel patterns of this area. Um, the highest, highest end hotels uh, that we're targeting business people will probably do well. People will want the best services, the best cleaning, the best uh, experience. They don't want to risk themselves and they don't want to take risks on who cleaned and how do they clean my room. They want to know 100% what happened. Uh, and there will be also some high quality brands, but are still lower grade that will also do well for the business travel. Uh, families travel, we, we still don't know. We want to see the consumer sentiment, and I don't think we are smarter than other people. We need to see what will happen in two, three months when people will start to open up and say, okay, I'm, I'm cooped up enough in this apartment. We've got to travel. Where do we go? Are we going internationally? Probably people will stay more in their countries um, because they will feel that if you go international, you may be quarantined if the, if the corona comes back. All of this will be heavily impacted by finding a, uh, a vaccine, which I think they're already announcing. Today was an announcement. Uh, Johnson & Johnson said that they will come out with a vaccine, uh, first stage for doctors. The more people come with solutions, um, the more we will get this out of the system. Our expectation that this can take, as I said before, between 12 and 24 months, because there won't be enough vaccine for everyone. Sorry, you had another question. We have loads of questions. People are writing a lot of questions I didn't even get to yet. But you know, I, can't, I cannot not compare, and you'll probably tell me it's completely different things, but you know, we saw it on TV as well. They do the comparison. Tal, you're, for me, New York City, which is a tough city that dealt with crisis before and is in the middle of a major crisis right now. And you cannot not compare this Samuel to 9-11. Uh, we, we, we speak about it in our events uh, that are more private. I will not speak about it here. I lost a relative there. You experienced 9-11 like nobody else, obviously. 
Um, almost 3,000 people died then. And by the way, these crises, unlike the Great Dep Depression and others, are all involved with death uh, of people. So, and now we're talking about over 10,000 people. I, I feel like as if there's like 9-11 is happening simultaneously all across the world. How do you see that? How do you see New York coping with what's going on? I mean, you've been through one very serious crisis. It's different, of course, but still. Uh, it's very different. I think look, the, the country and the world is used to uh, people uh, passing away from different types of disease uh, out there. And as, uh, as I'm sure the administration will say at some point, look how many people passed from the flu. And here we had this number and it's in proportion to what passed from the flu. But let's not forget, this is after lockdown and this is uh, in a situation where it could have been much, much worse. It's still not going to be great, but it, it could have been much worse. Every week we slowed by uh, responding, uh, caused more and more potential uh, death. And there was something in the uh, a nice article in the Times that showed that if we started two weeks before, we could have saved about 90% of what we expect to see the loss today. Um, at 9-11, it was a very intentional attack. And the risk there was it was a war, a real war with a smart and thinking entity uh, that decided to hurt us. Here, it's a different type of war. We look at it as a war, but it's a war against, uh, call it nature, and you know, some sort of a virus that evolved to this situation, jumped to the humans from other animals, and now is starting to attack us, and we will find a cure and a solution. Uh, for a period of time, it can evolve, it can continue to evolve because we, the solution will not be deployed every, to every person in the world uh, and there will be different variations that may surface five, ten years from now uh, that could impact, impact us differently. At 9-11, um, we were at kind of the epicenter of it, hit by, um, by the terrorist attack where we bought the Twin Towers, uh, Larry Silverstein, my, my father-in-law bought it six weeks prior to 9-11, with the hope that he's going to enjoy life and, and retire eventually uh, after a long life of hard work. And all of a sudden, life changed immediately, dramatically, at a shock to, to us, of course, to the people who lost lives, and to the city of New York and to America. First time that real war came into our borders, into our country. Pearl Harbor, when it happened, it was outside the physical borders of the U.S. It was U.S. territory, but outside. And then we went to war. Here, we decided very quickly to declare a war at 9-11. We saw, and the personal story is very different, uh, but there were companies that when they were hit, like Cantor Fitzgerald, which was one of our tenants, that lost 68.5, percent of their employees in one day. For them, that shock was incredible. The... the, the the lives lost, the psychological, that, that's 658 employees they lost out of 960 people. Uh, that company was hit very badly. Um, we lost employees and we were shocked. The, Larry that day could have not been with us because he expected to go by himself. He was starting to put his jacket and uh, Clara, my mother-in-law says to him, what are you doing? And he said, I'm, I'm going to a meeting. He was meeting every day, the tenants at the top of the building at the restaurant, Windows on the World, if you remember that restaurant, which was beautiful views, beautiful place. He said, no, you have a dermatologist appointment with me. And he said, I cancel it. And she started to get upset. And he said, okay, okay, yes, dear. That's the thing he always teaches people. Uh, it seems to work well. And he decided to go to the dermatologist and his life was spared. Um, we were very, very fortunate in that capacity. Um, Lisa decided to go um, that morning to try a driver and the driver couldn't find the house in Scarsdale. And uh, took him 45 minutes, so she was late, 20 minutes to the office, just got stuck on the West Side Highway when the planes hit. She could have been in the building if that happened, so she was spared. Um, we, at that point, we made a decision, we are not going to give up. Just like today, we're not going to give up. Nobody. Uh, unless they are on, uh, in the ICU uh, and, and they cannot uh, make the decision, if someone can make the decision, 
nobody should give up. We should all fight and we will all fight together and eventually come out of it. It may be challenging. It may be shocking to some people that are not used to these type of situations. But when we fight together as people, as, as individuals, as families, we survive these things as hard and as tough as they are. So that's our comparison. Of course, it's not the same. Uh, for someone who was hit then, a family that lost a loved one, um, there is no comparison anymore. And here at someone that lost another loved one, um, my assistant, uh, her, her uncle just passed away from uh, COVID-19. So for her, it's, it's, there is no condolence that can help. There is nothing that can, can make people feel better um, other than we'll all fight through it. And you know, it's part of life. Every day we get closer to, to that same destiny. Let's just make sure that we do it the right way and that we all work together to make our lives better and other people around us lives better. Thank you. Now, um, you sent me um, um, a presentation, uh, a short one. Do you want to uh, try to look at that? Um, sure. You, you asked me some questions before, so I thought um, this was just answering a simple question. It has effectively two slides or an opening slide. And it talks about what do we, what do we see in terms of, um, yeah, in terms of what is going to come, what will come out here. Um, I don't know if you can do it as a full screen, but yeah, we'll try. Th this is a famous photo of uh, what happened after World War II in America, where the kind of the V-Day, um, I don't know, maybe Control L. Oh, no. I'm on my laptop here, so. Ah, okay, you can leave it, that's okay. okay. Um, but it, we're talking about, this is the V-Day photo. Uh, we don't think it would be a V uh, return to normal. It would be, as we look at uh, what happens in China and in Korea and now expected in Germany, uh, those type of photos of there is one day, one, one shot where everything is great and people are smiling on the streets is not likely to happen now. It will come over time. So if you go to the next uh, slide, you'll see basically the expectation. Uh, and here it's an aggregate of smarter people than us. And what we expect in our company when we discuss it with our team is that if you don't touch anything and you don't, uh, you don't do any of the lockdowns, you get to a, a disaster because the ICUs are overwhelmed, the hospitals are overwhelmed, and that's a terrible situation. So we know that we are now in a, in a lockdown situation. In the US, it's not as harsh in, in, as in some other countries, but there is a lockdown. And then you ease people back to the workforce in stages. Kind of a reverse of what happened when they started saying, please um, work alternating 50% and only let 25% go to the office or to uh, retail and only essentials. So when you ease it, you ease it in, in chunks. Germany just announced that they're gonna ease going back to work and they're going to let people open retail up until a certain size of retail. We'll do that. If it doesn't outbreak too fast, then they will let more people and more people. So eventually when you'll take enough time, let's say 12 months from now, six months from now, or 18 months from now, and people would look back and say, oh, we're actually pretty comfortable living with this. We have to go to certain places with a mask. Um, we know that the vaccine is coming. We don't have it yet for everyone, but we see life as it, uh, should be starting to be uh, okay and people can go when you're going to open spaces you don't need the mask when you're going into a, a dense store or into a subway you do need a mask and they'll figure out how to behave so this is the waves you see here if you look at the black line on the screen mm -hmm. there will be a safety threshold the, the governments will declare there will be a, an easing effort if you, the disease will go up a little and down in terms of uh, people being affected they will have more testing they'll come out of it and the end will be a, a decline that people will start to feel very comfortable. This is how we look at it, how we control, how the governments will control, how the cities and the states will control the uh, going back to the normal. That's, uh, that's what we see. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I will, I will soon jump to the other area where, that you know very well, uh, technology. So I might as well, while I'm here, I asked you before we spoke about the do dojo, which I thought was, amazing because uh, it basically has a solution for uh, what's going on right now. So I wanted you to explain about it. So I, I want to jump to that slide um, uh, because uh, this is really, really interesting. 
Um, so if you can share a couple of words about that. Okay, again, I don't want to take credit from others. I, I did not invent this, so it's not, I don't take any credit. Um, we work with um, startup companies. We have a platform that works with startups that selects some of the best startups that we see. Uh, under 1% of the startups we meet with that say we would like to be part of this platform. It's run by very smart people. I don't think this is the forum to discuss. And one of the things we tasked the CEOs over a month ago is saying, okay, we see this coming, this wave coming from uh, Asia and Europe. We see that it's about to hit us hard. We had a meeting with all the CEOs and we said, can you do something to better the environment? Can you develop things or take your technology and divert it to help with a pandemic that is showing up or it, we didn't call it a pandemic I have to say but uh, a big crisis that is coming and we started seeing those CEOs thinking long and hard how to solve and we can discuss it and uh, luckily they're doing very well they managed to raise significant amount of capital in the last uh, month and a half two months mm -hmm. um, the startups are doing very well and some of them are brilliant uh, so what you've shown here uh, oops, the, the slide went away is an example of one of the companies called uh, dojo which is basically creating a call it a training ground like when you go to the dojo to become a better uh, warrior or better in martial arts uh, and i i trained in martial arts i was an, an instructor so i i felt very connected to this uh, mind say um, and they created the system and they're offering it now for free so there are no strings attached no nothing where they map every company and we are now going to roll it out with our tenants and every tenant is offered this again for free uh, as a system. We also have tenants outside of our portfolio asking for it. We already ran it with tenants when the outbreak came and now we're gonna run it as the, the day after, we call it the day after tomorrow, coming back to work. The system basically looks at where is every employee sitting in the office. And when you say, oh, this employee that comes to the office tomorrow, let's say his name is Joe coming in, uh, he's showing signs of uh, fever, corona, he needs to be tested. We're saying, let's, the system tells you digitally, very quickly, who is this person sitting next to? Uh, who are the people that are closest in terms of circles and, and, and uh, geographical, physical presence? And who are the people that this person met with in the last uh, 14 days or five days, depends on the stage of the expected uh, stage of the disease. And then you can alert these people. The system will just alert these people. They were sitting next to someone. They don't have to tell them whom that is showing signs of corona. Of course, if you have a company, let's say, of uh, 400 people and seven people show up in the morning, and it will happen, I'm pretty sure. Maybe not seven people, maybe five, maybe 10, but some people will show up in the morning. We've seen it happen before, and we'll see it happen later. They show up to, to the office, and they are showing signs. They have fever, and you say, okay, please go home, quarantine yourself or go get tested. In the meantime, let's alert those people that were sitting next to them or met with them in the last uh, two weeks that they have high exposure rate. And the longer they spend, the system puts them and aggregates them in groups. If you met with someone for five minutes in the same conference room, you're less likely to expose them than if you sat with them seven times every time for half an hour, and that's three and a half hours you spend time with them, and now you have signs of corona. So you have to tell them, please stay at home. Don't come to the office tomorrow. We don't recommend you for, to come. The decision should be the decision of the CEOs. Uh, and we do it in a way that doesn't, or not we, the company does it in a way that doesn't uh, affect privacy because it can, it doesn't have to tell you who is the person that was infected. It just tells you, you were exposed, please take care of it. Go get tested, uh, stay at home. And the CEOs need to make the decision, which we recommend strongly, to continue to pay the people uh, when they're working from home. Now that they see that it's doable, uh, they should just control the uh, impact of sick employees. You don't want to infect everybody in the office. Uh, you also have to make sure that we deal with privacy. So all of this is taken care of. Simple system. It, it's launched for free to the tenants saying, just enjoy it, use it. We already have tenants using it and are raving about it. Said so it saves them a lot of headache, a lot of time, and a lot of infection rate uh, from the first stage. Then there was a period now that nobody goes to the office. And in the going back to the office, they're all saying, I have to use it. And there are new and new features added. Uh, like you have to submit the floor plan if you want to know closer who is sitting next to whom. If you don't, you only get the information about who met with whom in, in a conference room, in a boardroom, uh, in meetings like that. This is a simple example of a system that is backtracking the infection expectation and the probability of infection. It doesn't, tell into, it doesn't take into consideration and doesn't affect People can be affected by their kids. If you have five kids running around going to school or, not, or running on the street, 
they could bring it to you. But it does say, within the office, you are exposed, please go and stay at home. What's the name of the platform? The, the platform is called, what you just saw, Backtrack, and it's by a company called Dojo. If you go to dojo.co, uh, dojo.co, um, that, that company, is, that's what they're offering for free. We ask them to offer it for free. We have other companies, uh, other startups, for example, a company that uh, just announced they raised $30 million at uh, over $100 million valuation, which was started by a technician uh, that in the past was solving and fixing things like print, big printers or industrial printers or air conditioning units. And he said, this is, the company started a few years ago, but when this corona things happen, it immediately converted the direction of the system. What it does, it's predictive analytics and uh, using artificial intelligence to predict what technicians should bring to the field to fix a machine. And even before the machine falls apart, it sends some signals, the system captures it and says, this machine is about to stop. So it's very critical today for all the MRIs and CTs and X-rays, which are the best predictive systems today to know if someone has corona, the COVID-19. Uh, and we don't want to send technicians and that the technician didn't bring their parts and it takes them another two weeks. The system predicts that this, is, this machine will break down and you need to send the technician. It saves a lot of money to the company, to the hospitals. So they immediately converted and diverted a lot of their energy in this direction and they have tremendous demand uh, to their business. We no, have I, yeah. any other companies doing the same. I have many, many questions for you coming from people. So I'm sure we will not have time for everything, but I wanted to ask, you know, just before we go to that, you know, as a technology space, as an entrepreneur, you know, some companies don't have thick layers of capital. I think many funds will find that their commitments are no longer there. Um, startup companies will find it very hard these days uh, to navigate. What are you, what are you seeing? What are, what is your advice to entrepreneurs with the companies you guys work with? And, and yeah, how do you see the tech world? Uh, dealing with it, especially those, I'm not talking about the Amazons, I'm talking about startups, uh, promises of tomorrow. It's a great question. Um, I look at my past, I was an entrepreneur of uh, two different startups and times like this are times to move very, very aggressively and fast. It's the time that uh, if you want to survive, you can become very good. It's time to do the changes as we discussed before. If you need to trim workforce, if you need to uh, reduce salaries, that's fine. Right size the company and the organization to be the most lean and efficient and then run very, very quickly because the opportunities are there. And people react much better to companies who have a good mission and a good vision and a good purpose. Just to try and sell more of a specific product usually is not the, the best idea. But if you divert your energy in the right place and you're a good people, they do very well. Um, and I've seen it in the past, I've seen how it works. I sit with the startups and they really, they are thirsty to understand what should they do. I usually prefer to listen more than to say, I can sit with them for an hour and speak for two minutes, but sitting with them and they are smarter about their business than, than I would ever be. But some questions or directed questions can help take the business and, and help them. I have people like Charlie Federman, who was uh, incredible in, in all his life of helping companies become successful. He's working with the startups. So now we work more. Some of the things we tell the startups is now is the time to spend more and more time, as hard as it, as it is at home. Some of them, it's, it's very difficult, but they have to work day and night because now they can capture a lot of business. Usually out of the uh, crisis, like we saw it at 9-11, we saw it in 2001, uh, we saw it in the 2008 uh, uh, tobacco and 2009. The companies that go out of it successfully are usually either the big tech because they, they know how to run fast and they take the advantage and a lot of their competition goes away. So uh, the market itself looks at credit and looks at who is uh, the biggest provider and they go with them. So a lot, if you have a competition, even if it's not the best product coming from a Google or a um, and Microsoft, and then it came from smaller companies, unless they have a very, very uh, strong advantage, at times like this, the, the other companies that are buying the product or using the product are less prone to take chances. They will go with the big players. So they have an advantage. And also when other companies are trimming down, nobody, they say nobody got uh, fired by picking uh, Microsoft or nobody got fired by picking Cisco. But if there is a competition, 
that is competing directly head to head, even if it's a little better, it's harder. Or the startups that, that have some differentiation work harder because now you capture, it's a land grab situation. And after these situations with a market like this, a lot of the biggest companies materialize and come out as winners. So it's a good time uh, to put a lot of effort, to put a lot of energy, and that time and that energy will not come back. If you work at the same pace as before, I, I feel that uh, the chances of that startup are very low. It means they're not adjusting to the situation. It's like a meteor strike that hit the earth. Uh, we have to recover and we will recover, but those animals that keep on doing the same as they did before, and keep on eating in the pastures and don't adjust, they, they will not make it. Those who adjust quickly and say, okay, we can't go in this area, we have to move to that area, we have to adjust our product, our messaging, everything, those will survive. You cannot use marketing, the same marketing that you used before, for example, for a product and showing people dance, dancing in a party or running on the beach when people are locked down at home. You have to quickly adjust your marketing, your strategy, your business. So I, we are seeing startups doing very, very well. And those that uh, at least that are sitting with us and asking for advice. And by the way, if someone doesn't want our advice, it's fine. They, they may be doing okay on their own. We, in most of these cases, we try and take a step back and, and not get involved. Now I see, I have, I have so many questions to ask you, but I see here a, a question, I'm just taking out of what, we have 10 questions that didn't touch uh, from, from people right now. Um, and I know you don't have much time. Um, um, so again, we will do, I hope, another session. Uh, would you say this is a good time uh, um, to top uh, up US residential property portfolio? <laughs> where? The question is where? Um, so we're looking at a lot of opportunities and it's really a matter of price and of finding the right value in what you invest. I think it's a very good asset class if you know what you're doing and where you're doing it and uh, the blend of the people there and the tenants. The buildings and the real estate is as beautiful and as successful as the tenants that fill the building. That's the bottom line. And if you have bad tenants or you have poor tenants that are going to fall uh, into troubles all the time, then it it should be a very different type of business over there, right? It's not like there are no nursing homes and no uh, low income. There are, but you need to know what you're building and what you are owning. And if you are trying to own a property in Manhattan or in uh, Chicago or in uh, Atlanta or in different locations, find the asset that the tenant mix is the right tenant. So dive, double click on it and go into the asset itself, every tenant. Who are they? What is their credit? What are their type of jobs? Really understand the people. If you don't understand the people, you're just buying it because someone showed you an Excel. We don't do that. I don't recommend doing that. And if that's the case, in this economy, take a step back and don't do it. If you're, if you're talking about flipping and maybe there is an opportunity and someone calls and says, oh, you can buy it 80 cents on the dollar, 60 cents on the dollar, it doesn't mean that it won't go to zero cents on the dollar because there is a lender on it. You need to really evaluate what is the asset, who is the holder, what is the reason it's being sold, and what is the opportunity for you to improve. Um, that's our belief. Again, I don't think we know everything. I think we, we know what we do. We think we know it pretty well. And we are also more risk averse than other people. We don't like to take high risks. Mital, as, a, as an ex-journalist, I, I, I must uh, ask you a question that nobody else knows, I think. Um, <laughs> Lisa, your wife, your dear wife, I know she's doing something uh, amazing right now to help New York City these days. So I, 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 could you share anything about that? Well, she's doing a lot, but uh, she's trying to stay out of the, the lights. Um, she connected, for example, the, uh, a, she went to the food tracking uh, business, a, a gentleman called Ben that um, has a lot of food trucks, over 50, and said, why don't we feed the doctors uh, and, and all the nurses and the medical staff that are working so hard, they can work 16, 18 hours a day, they barely sleep, uh, and try and get them food as, as uh, quickly, as efficiently, sterilized, clean, for free. Uh, and now all the doctors and uh, the medical staff at NYU and now extended to, uh, to other hospitals across the city are getting free food so they can step out. They know it's ready and it's clean. They know it's sterilized. The staff that is delivering it, it's, they're just coming out the door, get the food, go back in. Nobody, no questions asked. They need to be taken care of. We try to do this and expand this. Uh, across other cities, but the first focus was New York, which is the epicenter, the biggest problem. This medical staff, they are the heroes of this time. 
they are the first responders of 9-11. They are the ones who are taking care of everybody, every life. Whoever walks through the door, they'll take care of them. Our job and obligation as, as teams here is to help them and do everything in our powers to help them become more successful, happier, get as many hours of sleep as they can because they barely sleep and they should not be in a time of hardship. We found some of these doctors that came from other cities, didn't have anywhere to stay. Uh, we took apartments that we had, one apartment or two apartments that were available, we immediately furnished them and said, go in, you, you sleep here. We'll sterilize it in the morning, in the evening. We'll make sure you walk through the door. You can take your clothes off quickly so you don't infect anybody else in the building. Every action we can take, we have this obligation. I think everybody on the call, everybody I speak with has an obligation to help these people. And let's make it in a, in a way that it's not costing them anything. Uh, this is a big obligation. She did that. There are other elements that uh, we're focusing on. We want the medical teams in New York and in the country to do well uh, and to really get through this at the best way we can from our standpoint make their lives as easy and as, as productive as possible. And I have, uh, I will try to pick, you know, a couple of uh, questions here. Uh, um, as expected, Tyler, you are, we are bombarded with questions for you. Um, what changes in government or building regulations do you anticipate? Hi, um, I, I don't want to anticipate. I think we, we're sitting and waiting to hear what the government will come out. The, the uh, administration is kind of fragmented. Uh, who can really decide for the country or the state or every location? I think everybody is looking to other countries and what are they doing? Um, we have different plans, plan A, plan B, according to what they will come out in terms of uh, regulation. So we don't have one answer and we can't have it. If I had that crystal ball, that would be terrific, but we never bought it uh, when it was on auction. And we, we don't know what will come. We can expect different elements that they will come out with. We look at exactly what's happening in China. We had a video conference with looking at the buildings that they are now 85% open, but they have lines out the door and everybody's tested. And uh, then the question is of privacy. Are you allowed to test, not allowed to test? Uh, what do the legal documents say? What will the government say? Can you ask people to be tested for fever uh, and heat and their temperature when they walk into the building so they don't infect everyone or not? Um, there are many, many questions being asked now. And I'm not sure there is uh, a clear answer because I don't think the other side even knows what's the answer. They can change their mind tomorrow. They can think they know and then change their mind. We are ready for, we call it the day after tomorrow. We have a team that that's their job. They meet daily. They give us an update weekly and they talk about all the different outcomes that can show up. And we're happy to, by the way, if there are other landlords that are looking for that information, we're happy to update them on our findings. But the moment there will be something declared, it will be out there. Doesn't mean that every developer and owner will have all the tools. If they say everybody has to wear a mask, do you have enough masks for every employee? Because how do you then get the employees to get the masks? Do you have what kind of masks? Do you have every, uh, enough staff to uh, sterilize everything every hour? Like in China, they will sterilize every button on every elevator every hour. They will spray everything with certain materials that some of them are, by the way, not allowed in the United States. Um, they are not considered uh, healthy, or we don't in the United States consider them. So it's not our decision. It's a decision that will come from uh, a government or the state. In this point, we think the state, but we don't know for sure. And once it comes out, we'll have to react. We actually have storage, and, and we're getting things and materials and processes ready for the moment that the, the switch turns and we ask people to start showing up back to the office. Um, any, uh, uh, I see a couple of other questions. Where do you see cap rates on multifamily in New York City and national going? What happens if the Fed can no longer print money? Oof. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Two different questions. Um, so cap rates, everybody likes to ask the question of cap rates. Uh, I've been asked this question many, many times. I think that if the alternative is not great, and if uh, the asset is a strong asset like multifamily, it also depends on how much of that asset is paying you rent or not, uh, the cap rates are pretty solid because the interest rates go down. So um, we don't see, once there are no trades out there and there are none because everybody is waiting to see what will happen, where will the equilibrium be? Uh, I just want to remind, March 1st was the first 
case in New York declared of corona. March 1st, not the first casualty, the first case. We're now 36 days later uh, sitting and, and asking ourselves, and uh, so we are not 36 later from that date, we are now April 16th. Um, but we are sitting 36 uh, days after they told people to stay at home uh, and we are kind of locked down at home. At that, that's a very short period of time. That's not a year that we are sitting at home. It may feel for some people like a year, but it's a relatively short period of time. So in terms of the market, the market doesn't even know where it will balance. I think the assets that are very stable, like multifamily, eventually balance to a very low cap rate because the alternative to that is what? Where is your alternative? It's a very stable asset class. Uh, it's a very strong asset class. The things that impact it is a change of regulation, uh, a change of uh, if saying that nobody's allowed uh, to increase certain rents, that affects the cap rate because the upside is limited. But in general, the cap rate is, is uh, fairly solid and fairly stable, uh, and it depends asset by asset. I would expect it not to be dramatically uh, changed in the, in the next few months. It will stabilize somewhere. If, if every multifamily would find itself that only 90% of the tenants pay, it's a different story. I don't think that's where it will converge, but again, none of us know. Uh, you had a question, sorry, you had a second question about, um, if you can remind me that second question. Um, the second question, well, I don't have it in front of me anymore. I, uh, let me see, uh, answered. So he asked, uh, what happens if the Fed can no longer print money? What happens to whom? First, <laughs> we should ask the Fed. Um, we should ask, ask the government. I think they can and they will. I think the 2.2 trillion is not sufficient. Um, again, there are different stimulus plans. Uh, I don't think this will be sufficient. It's not only that we are losing a couple of months of people's time and work. Look back at your credit cards. Most people are spending now 20%, 30% of what they spent before on their credit card. Yes, they order food, but it's not the same as going out and shopping. Um, I'm taking out here the rent that they are paying, but the, the spend on their credit card is reduced. Uh, it will come back. There will be a, a return. It may be gradual, but it will all come back at some point. And uh, I think it's faster than some other people. But again, let's see. The, the Fed will have to figure out how to print more money in this case and help the economy to fuel the economy with enough capital to get America back on its feet. That's our expectation. Some people say it will be six trillion, some people say it will be four trillion. Uh, I think more on the up higher side, but I don't know. I really don't know. And we have um, and people asking me here about uh, Dojo, uh, the website and more information. I th you, you mentioned that dojo.com, that's the website. I .co. Dot .co, C-O, okay, yeah. so D-O-J-O dot C-O, that is the website of the company we just uh, spoke about before, um, so that's um, uh, yeah. that. Uh, how much time do we have, Tal? I know we're we are running out of time. We have another five minutes and I have to go. Five minutes, um, uh, okay, um, uh, let's see um, uh, what other questions we have. Now that e-commerce is exploding, do you think distressed urban retail locations should be converted to a new kind of last mile distribution center? Hmm. Um, there will be different companies. I, we don't know the answer. We know that uh, there are big winners, Amazon. We know certain companies that are doing well by helping aggregate the last mile. Uh, we'll see that both in the real estate uh, capabilities and companies that are providing the digital platform. One of our startups that is, uh, was in shock with this situation provided a system for small businesses. And we told them, offer it now to all the small businesses. There were originally a system that gave every store in the liquor business in, in New York and other places in the country the ability to create their own store and application so that you can buy from your local store. They started offering it now quickly. Within a month, the revenue jumped up hundreds of percent. They became profitable in March when they expect it to be profitable sometime in the middle of next year. Um, it's a big change. People are getting more and more comfortable with buying digitally, buying on their phone, instead of walking into a store. Uh, and they find that it's easy. You know, the, the normal understanding of a habit is that you have to do it 21 to 45 days to establish a real habit. 
either by diet or by exercising or anything you do. If you do it for now 30, 40, 50 days that you're buying through your phone, you start to see that it's very efficient, time, time efficiency and, and the ability to pick what you want and you get better prices, um, then people start to feel very good about it. We'll start to see a lot of companies migrate to this. It doesn't take away from the need to connect and go to a restaurant and go to some bigger places or to shop and touch some products but in certain categories uh, we'll see a, a big shift i think in how people consume it's not that we would not have gotten there before but this accelerated and created things much faster uh, and movement much faster into the digital world which is interesting i have here desiree pat now uh, and again i'm jumping from questions we will not answer all questions and I really hope I will ask Tom very nicely to do another session in, in, in a week or two, and I hope I'll get him to do that. Uh, but right now, Desiree Patno, uh, she interviewed you uh, before at our conferences from, the, uh, uh, from her Association of Women in Real Estate. Desiree, I'm sorry I'm not pronouncing the name correctly. Uh, I know that. A, a few months ago, she's asking endless commercial funding resources. How about now? How do you see that? Um. I don't think we have enough time to test it, but I think the, the funding will go down. It's expected to go down in times like this, especially because there are uh, a lot of the fundings that came from different countries um, that are now in a certain stressful or non-clear situation in uh, relationship with the United States. Uh, the administration is blaming certain countries, so immediately some money is shut down over there. We do see other places where countries that before were looking to invest in many countries now saying, okay, I need to go, and it's called the flight to quality. And they are specifically saying, I want to only invest in premium cities and in premium products. So they divert a lot of their energy. We see a lot of money coming from the Middle East or uh, certain countries in Europe that say, I, I no longer look to diversify and maximize my gain. I want to get the best product. Can you find me something in Europe? I'm getting these calls, our team is getting these calls uh, almost uh, daily now from investors that say, oh, we have money, we thought we are buying other, we just want to buy in New York, do you have something? We, we don't have that much to give them, but uh, we see that they are pushing and pushing to bring money. I, I don't think it's going then to look for uh, smaller products and like before it, it's starting to go into other cities. So some cities like Nashville and others may be impacted negatively and some cities where you're doing the flight to quality um, like Manhattan, like LA, uh, we'll get a, a better uh, feel. Or Seattle, close to uh, companies like Microsoft and Amazon, may be impacted to the to the benefit of those cities. There is no uh, full clarity of where this is headed. A lot of it has to do with the uh, dynamics. If if uh, the United States will be considered as a good friend to many countries, today it's considered a safe haven. When things go bad, people are saying, "Okay, where is it stable?" I, I don't know what, but I know that I want stability. And I know I get very little to no return from just buying or leaving the money in the bank. Uh, the interest went even down further. So they need to invest it somewhere. They need some return and they look for the quality. So it, I think it will bounce back for those who have good quality assets and it will to some extent disappear for those who have second tier, third tier quality assets. So Tal, regardless of the fact that I have so many questions I planned uh, that I got through uh, people before and questions I have right on here, uh, I, I hope we, uh, and, and the fact that things change so, like every minute, uh, I, I will uh, definitely hope uh, and we'll update our um, folks here if we can do another uh, a session and talk some more. Sure. Um, and um, uh, again, I'm being asked about Do Dojo. I think we'll, we'll just send them an email with some information. You can, you can circulate my email. So if people have specific questions, I can connect them with the right people. I'm very comfortable with that. And uh, if people have unique questions that are more one on one that are not interesting for the entire group, let's take them offline and I'll answer. I'm happy to get on the phone. Uh, uh, my days are usually packed, so it will have to be in the evenings, but I'm happy to get on the phone with people who have uh, very specific questions. And I'm sure the answers are more tailored to their needs and their business. Thank again, you so I, much, Tal. Yeah. I, I'll say goodbye, but before I say goodbye, I want to again say, I don't want credit for any of the things here. It's coming from the aggregate information of a, a big team behind us and a great team that is behind me that is giving the information and talking to CEOs. So it's kind of aggregating the collective knowledge and collective wisdom of a lot of other people 
I don't think we are any, in any way, or definitely I'm not smarter than others. I'm just getting this information and I'm happy to share the, the consolidated information of what I'm hearing. And thank you for taking the time. It's yeah. always very modest. Thank you, Tal, so much uh, for being here. And I'm looking forward to speaking uh, uh, with you again. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. And uh, I will just Take say care, to all of you here, bye-bye, Tal. Have a great day. Um, uh, thank you uh, for uh, being with us here um, uh, today. I will tell you what we have expected um, um, uh, in the next week. Uh, next week, we will actually be dedicating it to art. As uh, some of you know, I'll be speaking to Nancy Spielberg. Uh, the sister of Steven Spielberg, philanthropist, producer, writer, about what's going on in the film industry, about her growing in a magical uh, family. She was, uh, her brother, when they were young, used to direct her and her siblings. He helped him in his early films. Uh, and she's going to be talking with us about what's going on in the film industry that basically is shut down completely. And another um, is Wendy Fetterman, also next week. She's, uh, she's a second generation to a major family. Um, she was never too passionate about the business. She was just in it, born into it. And the minute they sold, she followed her, her, her dream and her passion and went to Broadway. Uh, she's today one of Broadway's top producers, an award-winning producer, and she will be talking with us about Broadway that actually from today to tomorrow has been shut down and we don't know what's gonna happen with all the tickets that were sold and everything that was canceled. I don't worry about Hamilton, but you know, uh, very interesting. And the next week after that, we'll be speaking with uh, uh, Uri Levine, the founder of Waze, the person that, disrupt, that disrupts his neighbors, his sectors, everybody, uh, and a fascinating person. And Dov Moran, one of uh, the most exceptional entrepreneurs to ever come out of Israel, uh, the inventor of the flash drive uh, disk on key that sold for $1.7 billion to SanDisk. And this is just the beginning. Uh, I, uh, if you see my videos, you see who else is talking uh, uh, with me in the next month. I apologize about today's um, um, late start. We had an issue with my uh, computer here, so I just grabbed my laptop. That's why you see me so close. Thank you so much for being here, uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing you next week. I know you have a lot of questions for Tal. We'll do another session with him. Send me questions if you have. Take care, stay safe, and I'm sorry we didn't answer all of the questions. Uh, email them to Ayal. You have Ayal's email. And we will do another session, hopefully in two weeks with Tal. We can continue our discussion. Thank you so much for being here with us.